current president. And so, you know, so making money is a virtue, and people write books and sell these programs to make money. But, but let's take, you know, the field of how do you get an intelligent, well-educated, what kind, what kind of you do, what, what kind of lessons do we have from neuroscience and from science in general? And so the number one rule is if you want a smart baby, have a smart mate. That's the number one rule. Okay? So uh, it's absolutely the case from what we've learned in the last few decades that intelligence has a very high hereditary function to it. The so-called G factor, psychologists call it. It's absolutely the case. People don't want to talk about that because they think you know it's not politically correct and so on. But it's absolutely true that smart parents make smart babies. Okay. So, uh, but what can we do beyond that, and what kind of lessons do we have uh, from uh, from neuroscience? So, uh, here's the kind of popular views that uh, various magazines have. This is a, a news magazine uh, in, in uh, America uh, that, uh, you know, whole issue emphasized to how to raise smart kids based on stuff from neuroscience. Here's another issue, your child's brain. Now, what parent's not going to buy that? You know, you, you need to know about your child's brain. So you buy that. How kids are wired for music, math, and emotions, right? You want to know that. And uh, here's a book that was a bestseller in the United States, the Mozart Effect. Have you anybody hear about this book? So this is a book that basically said, you want your kid to be another Mozart? Play Mozart to your kid even before the baby is born. And so what this did was it sold a lot of books, but it also it did a good thing. It sold a lot of Mozart albums. So mothers were playing you know, Mozart to the kids in, in utero. And that was based on the fact that, by the way, it's absolutely true that in the last trimester, the, 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 the fetus can perceive sound. Absolutely true. So people have recorded from the, uh, from the uh, fetus, and they can, they can differentiate, they can, uh, brain reacts to sound. Not only does the brain react to sound, but it reacts differently to different kinds of sounds. But that's a big leap from that finding to the fact that you can make your kid another Mozart uh, by doing this. So this is kind of the popular press. Most of these things are written by not neuroscientists, but by journalists. On the other hand, there is this position. This is a book that was put out a few years ago by the National Academy of Science in the United States, and here's what they said. Neuroscience can offer few insights into how early development can function to enhance development beyond what might be considered uh, otherwise expected. Totally different point of view, kind of a pessimistic point of view. But, but let me tell you five things that I think that the science supports about how to raise a smart and, and uh, children uh, to their optimal potential. And so this is stuff, you know, some of it may, may seem obvious to you, but this is stuff that can be supported by the science without any, you know, major uh, overblown statements. So here's some specific suggestions. Okay? These are from me, and I think this is something that all neuroscientists would agree on. So the first statement that is absolutely the case is do no harm. It's very there's very little evidence that you could take somebody of a given intelligence level as measured by IQ tests and do stuff to make them su superior IQ. Bad performance, yes, but there's a lot of evidence that you could say, take somebody of a certain level and put them in situations where they're harmed and their intelligence level falls down by various ways. And so these things actually start in utero. So for example, you know, uh, meat for the normal brain development, you've got the stuff on the left here, and the stuff that's detrimental. And this has been well known, alcohol, lead poisoning, tobacco, <coughs> prenatal infections, and things like that. Unfortunately, in the United States, we currently have an a, a, a opium a, epidemic. And so you have a lot of babies being born that have been subjected to serious drug abuse by, by the uh, pregnant woman. And that's causing you know, major kind of problems. So that's the first thing. And, and here's, here's something about brain development that you may or may not know. The brain is it develops, is put together in a kind of con counterintuitive way. <coughs> what happens is that when you were in utero, or when you were a certain age, the, you had more synaptic connections in the brain than you have currently. So the brain is built by overproducing cells, overproducing, and I'll show you examples of that from my own work, overproducing connections, and then is what's called pruning of synaptic connections. Certain connections stay, certain are, are gone. And take a look at that. 
This is a very famous uh, slide. There's been uh, in many textbooks by a guy called Charles Nelson at the University of Minnesota. And what he shows there are three areas of the brain. Of the, this is happening in, in uh, the human brain. And what he shows is the change in the number of synapses during development. So you start out at a certain point in development, no synapses, no connections are formed. The number of synapses in the different areas increase, increase, increase to a certain age. So for example, three years old, and then they start dropping down to adult level, to an adult level. What, so there's a pruning of connections. It doesn't mean that more synapses are better. In fact, there's evidence that more synapses is worse. It's a normal kind of process that goes on. And so if you look at that, if you look at that, the teenage brain is still getting synapses pruned. And actually, there's now new evidence that the normal connections in a human brain are not really developed until about early 20s. So, so this is a, 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 a something that uh, has been well documented in all kinds of species. And here's some work I did with a, with a uh, professor from UC Irvine a number of years ago in the fetal monkey. So you have two hemispheres. I'll show you a picture of that, a left hemisphere and a right hemisphere. And those hemispheres are connected by a massive number of axons. Of, uh, these are fibers of nerve cells. There are about, in your brain and my brain, on the order of 250 million of them. Okay? And what we were studying is the development of these colossal projections in fetal monkeys. At the University of California, where I was a professor for many years, we had a primate center, one of seven such centers in the United States. And so we were able to get fetal monkeys, and we studied the, uh, we were able to get time pregnant fetal monkeys. We were studying them at, at a time when the monkey was about that big, like that. And what we did was we were able to inject these dyes into a, a monkey brain and, and on one side of the brain and look at the neurons on the other side of the brain that project from one side to the other, so-called coll colossal projection neurons. And this is a early fetal monkey. The uh, 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 gestation in a monkey, in a rhesus monkey, is 165 days. This is about 100 days before birth. And all those white things you see, those white specks you see along there, those are individual neurons. Many hundreds of thousands of them. Every one of those specks is an individual neuron. Maybe, maybe. Can you? Hello? Yeah? Okay, so. Good, but it's not good. So see, every one of these, every one of these is a neuron. And what you see is, there's just a continuous array of neurons all around this part of the fetal monkey brain, okay? And when you look at, a, at a, 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 a fetus about a month later in development, this is normal, normal developmental uh, structure. This is what we found. Okay? Now, you don't have to be an anatomist to say there's something very different about this than that. There are fewer neurons, okay? yes. and they're distributed in ways that are very different than that. That's a continuous pattern distribution. This is a pattern distribution that is discontinuous here. There are relatively few neurons, whereas there were a lot there. Here there are more, but there's still a lot fewer than there. So these colossal connections during normal development are just lost. So, the, so you have many more of these connections, and you and I have the same thing. When you were a fetus, then when you, then when you became born. And so, so this kind, these kinds of regressive events are very common in the building of your brain, my brain, and all species that have been, many species have been looked at. And this is one of the things I worked at. We published this in the prestigious National Academy of Sciences uh, a number of years ago. So, here, so one of the reasons, one of the factors for the loss of these connections is something you wouldn't suspect. And that is the fact that in the developing brain, in the fetal developing brain, neurons are active already. They're not just lying there. And this happens to be a recording that was made in my lab of two neurons. This is one neuron, and this is another neuron. The time scale here is 25 seconds, so time is here. <clears throat> These recordings were made simultaneously by an MD, PhD in my lab called William Wong, who came from the University of Beijing. And what he did was he was able to put electrodes into the retina the retina is the back of the eye that contains all the cells that process visual information and sends information to the brain. And one of the things about the retina is, and this has, this has problems 
clinical problems is the retina is very easy to detach. You've heard about this detached retina. You get hit in the eye, the retina becomes detached, it dies, you become blind. But for experimental purposes, you anesthetize an animal, say a mouse in this case, you just remove the retina, put it in a dish, and it stays alive for days. Okay? And under the microscope, you can look at this retina and record from these cells, called ganglion cells, that form a connection between the eye and the brain proper. And that's what he did here. This is before the animal can see anything, because there are no photoreceptors. So light cannot Im impact the system at all. Okay? But yet, these two cells, which are ganglion cells projecting to the brain, fire in a correlated way. So, this is one cell, and every 25 seconds or so, ba-boom, a couple of nerve impulses, then quiet, then ba-boom again. Very, quite regular, every 25, 30, 40 seconds, it does this. Completely spontaneous. You're not doing anything. You're not touching it. Next to it, and I'll show you these cells in a second, is another cell, its neighbor, and it goes with a burst of activity. At the same time, this one fires. Then quiet, this one fires, this one fires again like that. This, this activity is present in every mammalian species that we've looked at, beetle monkeys, mice, and almost definitely in humans. And I'll show you these two cells, how they were recorded from. Completely spontaneous. When you were a fetus, your brain was firing impulses. And here's the key thing. Depending on how these impulses fire, that will determine which connections, which synapses are eliminated and which are maintained. If you muck around with this activity by blocking with drugs or something, you completely change the pattern of connections in the visual system. Okay? So if you're doing stuff to in some ways interfere with the developing brain with, say, exogenous drugs or some kind of a infection, something like that, activity is going to be affected in the brain and connections will be, will be abnormal. So let me now show you these two cells that Dr. Wong recorded from. Okay, so, so here's this. So the electrode was placed, one in this cell, this is about 20 microns, one in this cell, and these are processing.